This video looks at the numerical details of how to construct the parameters in an optimal predictive control law. The previous video outlined a dual mode approach to predictive control, which ensured the optimized predictions do indeed match the global optimal behavior that you want. So you got sensible behavior. Now this was done for the unconstrained case and assuming a constant set point, which for now we've made zero for convenience. And we also assumed that the optimal was defined using an LQR regulator based on the same performance index. This video is going to provide the numerical details required to extend this approach to constraint handling. So while we're not doing the constraint handling here, we're giving you the basic number crunching underneath in the algebra so that you can set things up. Linear quadratic regulators. Now, optimal control is a standard topic in most control curricula. So if you assume a simple state space model and an infinite horizon performance index, something like this, and you put these two together, you'll get a standard LQR regulator. And if you want the formula, they're given here, but we're not going to dwell on that because that's standard in the literature. How did we define then an optimal predictive control law? We took what were called dual mode predictions. So predictions based around the implementation of an LQR regulator with some transient perturbations to the input trajectory. So in other words, you'll see the control law was given as u equals minus kx plus c during transients and just u equals minus kx asymptotically. And that's why we called it dual mode. So in other words, we had a transient mode for the first NC steps where you added these perturbations and we had a terminal state. And what we want to do in OMPC is optimize predicted performance with respect to these perturbations C, that's these terms here, and obviously implement just the first value. So what we're going to do is substitute these predictions into our standard performance index and then optimize with respect to C. So what do we need? We need to be able to express this J in terms of C so we can do the minimization in terms of C. And that's what this video will show you, how you actually express J in terms of C. A reminder then, we're going to use the arrow notation which has been used throughout this video series. So C right arrow K basically means take CK and stack it with CK plus 1 all the way down to CK plus NC minus 1. Here we don't need to go further because beyond that the C terms are assumed to be 0. Now this vector constitutes the degrees of freedom within our predictions and these are the things we can use to modify performance should that be something we need to do, or to satisfy constraints, and possibly to do other things where that is required. Now we're also reminding you that within the predictions we're assuming that these perturbation terms become zero once you get beyond NC steps. What we're going to use is this thing called an autonomous model formulation. So although we seem to have states x and we've got all these extra degrees of freedom and we've got two different modes and you're saying that's quite clumsy, what we're going to try and do is form an augmented model which makes these two modes look like just one mode and that makes things easier to handle. And the way we're going to do that is by treating the perturbation terms as extra states in our augmented model. So in other words, we reduce the model format to a single mode and this then means it's amenable to standard results and formula in the state space field. This is what we've got then. We seem to have two distinct modes. You can see the transient mode and the asymptotic mode. But I can combine those into a single equation. Now, you might want to pause this video in order to go through this more slowly and understand what's happening. But one of the things you'll notice is in both modes, I've got a phi xk, and that's this term here. You'll see I've got xk plus 1 depends on xk through phi, so I've got the same relationship. But the difference is, in the transient mode, I've got this bck term, and you'll notice that's given here. I've got b times 
Now it says see future, but you remember I've stacked all these zeros, so it's only going to take the top element of this see future. So that top row there gives me this equation here. And you might be saying, well, that means it doesn't give me this equation here. But that's only true if c is non-zero. If c is zero, then the same equation also applies. And what you'll notice is we've also got we've augmented this state with this C future, which is on both sides. And what's the relationship between C future K plus one and C future K? You'll see I've got this sort of matrix, which has got I on the upper diagonals. So this is in fact just a shift matrix. So it keeps shifting the C's along. And the key thing you'll notice is the very bottom row, if you were to look at it, is clearly full of zeros. So if you apply this once, then the bottom element of C future becomes zero. If you apply it twice, the bottom two elements become zero. And if you apply it n C times, then the whole of this C future becomes zero. So after n C steps, all these C terms become zero. And therefore, this expression at the top is now the same as this expression here. So this autonomous model formulation allows us to capture both modes in a single state space model by augmenting the state to include these C future terms. Now if you wanted to get the actual control law, UK is minus K comma and you'll see one zero 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 times XK C future K. So I've got an autonomous model formulation which basically captures both modes. Now for convenience I can now use this augmented state, I'm going to call it capital Z, my augmented transition matrix psi, and then I've got this KZ, where this matrix down, this is what I'm calling KZ. So I've now got a simple state space representation of my dual mode predictions. If I want to extract the original state, or the original perturbation, or the inputs, then what you'll find is I can find a gamma, such that gamma ZK is XK. Or I can find a different gamma here, I've called it gamma subscript C, so that gamma C ZK gives me C future, or I could just find an individual C if that's what I wanted. And similarly, I can find an expression for UK. And just a reminder, here are my augmented model. I've got ZK plus one equals psi ZK, and UK equals minus KZ ZK. What about optimal MPC then? What I want to do is express J in terms of the autonomous model states. So what I've done, if you remember before we had X, Q, X plus U, R, U, but I know that X is given by gamma Z, and I know that U is given by K, Z, ZK. So all I've done is replace the X and the U terms in my performance index with gamma Z and KZ, Z. So that now everything is written in terms of the states of my augmented model. Now what I'm going to do is substitute in from my prediction equations. <coughs> so here's my augmented model, ZK plus 1 equals psi ZK, and UK equals minus KZ, ZK. So I'm now going to substitute these expressions, or in particular this expression, into here. And this is what we get. You find I've got the sum from k equals naught to infinity of zk transposed, and then here's my um, weighting matrix in the middle times zk, so that's the same as the top. And now, if I recognize that I can write by inspection things like zk plus n equals phi to the n zk, then I get this expression down at the bottom. So you'll see I've taken z outside the brackets, and inside the brackets I've just got these psi to the k terms. So that's standard algebra, and again, if that looks a bit too quick for you, what I suggest you do is pause the video, and you'll see that it's relatively straightforward. Now, a bit of an aside, because we're going to need this. If you have an infinite sum, something like this, the bit I'm just circling here, s equals the sum from i equals naught to infinity, a to the power i transposed, q, a to the power i. Now, assuming, obviously, that a to the power i is convergent, goes to zero, then you can show that if I write a transposed s a, 
then it's the same as doing the sum from i equals 1 to infinity of a to the i transpose q a to the i, which is the same as doing s minus q. In other words, you can solve for s using this equation here. And the key thing is this s is a sum of an infinite number of terms, but I can solve for it using sim simple linear equalities. And this is called a Lyapunov equation. So what I'm going to do is now look at the formula I had for j, and I'm going to use this identity. So what do you notice? If you look at the formula we've got for j, you will see there's an expression in here which is fixed, doesn't change, and I've called that expression w. And then you'll see I've got a sum to infinity with these psi to the k transpose terms and psi to the k here, and that's all inside another brackets here, and I can call that sum to infinity s. So I can use a simple Lyapunov identity, psi transposed s psi equals s minus w. So I can solve for this s with a very simple expression. So what have I got now? Once I've solved for this s, I can show that j is given by xk transpose c future k transpose times s times this xk ck. Remember that z equals xk c future k. So all I've done is unpack z. If I now write s as sx in the top corner, sc in the bottom corner, and then sxc in each of the off diagonals, I can rewrite my j like this here. Now, just a reminder of the expressions we've got. This s is solved from this Lyapunov identity here, psi transposed s psi equals s minus w. w is defined down here, nice simple expression. Gamma is defined here, kz is defined here. So everything is nice and straightforward, very simple definitions. And from those, I can find my sx, my sxc, and my sc terms. So. The final question is, you might want some MATLAB code to show how easy it is to produce these. So we've done some code for you, and it's in this file, video underscore 43 example 1. So let's just have a quick look at that. So if I go to my MATLAB window, and you'll see, first of all, in this file, we define an A, B, C, D matrix, a Q and an R. So let's do that. And then I've got some arbitrary horizons for now. You'll see NC, NX, NUC. So let's do those. And finally, it's getting in the way of, we've got this expression down at the bottom. So if we run that, and that expression will give us our SX term. There it is. Our SC term. There it is. And our SXC term. There it is. Now, the interesting thing you might notice is the SXC term is essentially zero. See, that's 10 to the minus 14. Now, you might be interested in the underlying file, which has done all this work. And you'll see it's called chapter 4 underscore cost. And it's got arguments A, B, C, D, Q, R, and N, C. So if we go and have a look in that file, again, you'll see it's a very simple file. A bit of bookkeeping to define the dimension of your system. Define your LQR controller using DLQR and your phi matrix. And then you'll see a few lines to build your autonomous model. So that just goes through exactly what we've done in this video. You build your psi matrix, your gamma, your KZ. So nothing complicated there. Then you do your Lyapunov equation to solve for this big S matrix. There it is. And then you simply extract the different bits. So you'll notice the code is very simple, very brief. If I want to change NC, so we can show that, let's say, try NC equals 4. So let's rerun that file. And now, if you look, you'll find SX is the same as before, as you expect. SXC is still 0, though you can't tell it quite so easily there. And SC is now a diagonal matrix with 4 blocks. Now, we're going to discuss the actual structure of those matrix in more detail in the next video, which is why we're not going to go into it now. So a summary. An optimal MPC law should be constructed around the optimal closed-loop behavior from the unconstrained case. So we've argued that.
And this it video introduces the classical perturbation paradigm or dual mode description for these closed loop predictions. And in essence, we've shown you how you can build them. And we've used an autonomous model to represent both modes in what is an equivalent single mode formulation, but obviously a mode which has many more states. The performance index can now be constructed as a set of three terms which depend on the initial condition and the perturbation terms. So you can see the bit that depends on the initial condition, obviously you can't change that. You've got a bit which is um, linear in the perturbation terms and you've got a bit which is quadratic in the perturbation terms. And what we've shown is the code for defining this SX, this SXC, and this SC is very, very simple on MATLAB and very brief. And what we'll do in the next video is we'll look at these terms in a bit more detail to understand what they tell us.